anyway, I was in the studio with Rod Stewart, and the Rolling Stones, uh, Stevie Wonder, and people like that. And, uh, and we recorded with Capitol Records, and we had some songs that made it real big in the U.S. and also in England. They were all about recording Brown Sugar, and their minds were completely focused on that. There was only uh, actually three people in the studio other than the band, and that was Mick's girlfriend, the bodyguard, and myself. And I was always looking for happiness, and, and somehow my search kept going and kept going. I thought it was going to be, you know, the popularity, and we played colleges, and, and, and we did, you know, we'd open up for people like Cheech and Chong, and so the club owner comes up and uh, uh, interrupts our set, and he says, hey, look, I want this little guy to sit in on, on the drums. And so I told my brothers, you know, hey, let's play the hardest song that we know so so we'll make this the last time that our club owner will ever ask somebody to sit in. So we started playing this song, and this drummer was tearing it up. When we got through, I asked the club owner, I said, who in the world is that little guy? He said, you didn't know who that was? I said, no. He said, that was little Ricky from the I Love Lucy show. I said, you got to be kidding. And so he became our rock and roll drummer. And we traveled all over the United States going to and fro still looking for that happiness. And he'd tell us these stories, these horror stories of Lucille Ball and Desi Arnaz, how unhappy they were and they would get in these fights and they would throw these expensive dishes and how their world was just chaos. And, and he would tell me that he never really had a childhood being brought up on the set. And when he left the I Love Lucy show, then he went to be on the Andy Griffith show he was Opie's best friend, you know, Johnny Paul. But he never was happy, so uh, he, he was always doing drugs and getting loaded. He tells us one day, he said, look, we're not playing this weekend. I've heard my mother went off the deep end. I heard she got filled with the Holy Spirit. And, uh, and you know, he'd been brought up in a, in a religion that was quite contrary to that. I mean, that was a big no-no. And so... Anyway, uh, I said, man, if she got off into something like that, you need to go down there and help her out. So he goes to Lafayette, and so he comes back. He had a little green book, I'll never forget, in his pocket. And I was thinking, I hope this is not what I'm thinking it is, because I thought, it looks like one of the little New Testament things I've seen some people carry around. And so he said, look, man, he said, y'all come over here and sit down. I want to talk to you. I said, Okay. So we all sit down. I said, what's wrong? He said, oh, there's nothing wrong. He said, I want to tell you what happened in Lafayette. So he told us what happened. He went to Lafayette to help his mother out, not realizing he was going to get helped out because it was there that he got filled with the Holy Spirit. So about that time, he said, hey, look, we got to change the words to our songs. I said, what are we going to change them to? He said, to Jesus. I said, ain't no way. I said, we're playing with sticks next week. I said, can you imagine us getting up to the, and before all those people singing something about Jesus? I said, man, they'd be booing us off of the stage. He said, well, I quit the band right now. I was the most depressed I'd ever been. I couldn't explain it, but I was just so low because it was like everything I tried, even though I had success, even though I had the contracts, I had the band, I had the, everybody thought, you know, we were just like rock stars, stars and all that stuff. But there was still something missing. And on the way back to Laurel, Mississippi, where we were living at that time, this little Ricky guy talks to me about Jesus Christ. So it was that I gave my life to God, and that was in the year of 1977. We played a, a, a song called Noah, and we gave an altar call. And, and so there was a young girl that literally ran to the altar and uh, so I went down and prayed with her. She had a suicide note already written. She was going to take her life that night. It's stories like that that are so much more fulfilling. All those things don't even start to compare with the worth of one's soul.